hello also from my side. As mentioned, uh, I'm from Infineon and I did the work together uh, with other colleagues from Infineon and the University of Klagenfurt uh, together uh, in a European funding project. It's called IOSense. We work together on the following topic. So um, as an overview, first I want uh, to show you the system which I want to analyze, uh, giving some insight to uh, the sensor deviations and then uh, how to calculate the, the courage and uh, the conclusion outlook, what we can do later on with these figures. So this is the sensor system uh, we need to analyze. This was actually a real request also of one of our uh, integrated sensors. So we developed a sensor with two channel paths, so it's single path one and two. And um, now there is, uh, let's say, uh, the diagnostic function, which is used uh, to take the, the difference and also the sensor output where we take the average. So the original function for the output means uh, taking uh, both signals, yes, add them and divide them. And, but we also have a safety requirement from, from the system, which means the deviation from uh, our sensor output uh, compared to the, to the real value should be uh, smaller than a certain safety limit. And this was, uh, let's say, checked by this diagnostic function where we are calculating the difference. Yeah? So if the difference is excite exciting a certain diagnostic limit, then we should raise uh, a kind of failure flag. So uh, we can diagnose this, this point. So how did we do this? Um, this uh, starting with the sensor model, um, I modeled it that way that I said uh, the sensor output contains the ideal output plus the measurement uncertainty and a uh, kind of a fault. Yeah? And since I only want to uh, focus on the deviations, it's here in small letters, I only have a look on the uncertainty and the fault of sensor systems. And the, the uncertainty of each sensor system uh, for a simple calculated way uh, is done using Gaussian probability density distribution and uh, taking the uncertainty of both channels. Here's an example. Um, so I was working uh, with channel one with one kind of deviation. So uh, the mean deviation is the, the systematic drift, for example, the systematic deviation, for example, which we know for lifetime drifts, there is a drift, and uh, the statistic deviation from, from the uh, Gaussian distribution. So this is the, the measurement uncertainty of the two channels. And uh, the second part is the fault. So when we consider a fault, it could be anywhere in the signal processing unit. And uh, we distinguished here between two different kinds of faults. First one is a Gaussian fault. So uh, there are, let's say, faults inside the system which um, generate a very, uh, let's say, little deviation. And uh, we, in the first uh, step, uh, thought about analog faults, which uh, make a very small deviation, but also do it uh, in the Gaussian fashion. So in total, the deviation of the whole system is just a statistical addition of these Gaussian faults with the uncertainty of your measurement system. And, and the second uh, distribution which can occur is where we don't know exactly uh, how the fault is reacting. So the, the rest we distribute across our full-scale range of the sensor system. And at the end, we, uh, we superimpose everything together because um, uh, we are talking about independent faults. So uh, either fault one or fault two can, uh, can occur. So in that case, we can superimpose this one. So, and the, the tricky thing here is, especially for Gaussian faults, um, we don't know the standard deviation of the faults. And the idea here is um, to make a, a varying standard deviation. So we analyze all possible standard deviation from zero till, uh, to infinity and take, just taking the worst case. We will see later on how this works. Um, now coming to the diagnostic coverage calculations. This uh, we did using joint probability density functions and uh, Here's a short overview how, how this looks in a 2D or 3D graph. So these are the, the two-dimensional graph of deviations. 
x1 is the deviation of channel 1, x2 the deviation of channel 2, so you get then at the end uh, a nice joint probability density function, um, then also superimposed with the, with the faults, and uh, here we can continue to calculate uh, the probabilities. Um, going to the diagnostic function, as mentioned in the beginning, diagnostics is done by the subtraction of the first channel with the second channel, and this should be smaller than diagnostic safety mechanism limit, so in my calculations I use DSNL, and when we uh, have a look now on this uh, uh, joint probability density functions, uh, we have a look on all uh, points where the result of x1 and minus x2 gives the same number, so it reminds a little bit the, to the convolutional function, and we will see there are certain lines uh, with, with the same output. And on having uh, the line with the diagnostic limit, then we know everything outside this limit which we, we can detect. Yeah? Inside this limit, uh, uh, we, we don't raise an alarm. So the same happens, the same you can do also with the operating functions. So it's the, uh, the addition of the two channels and divided by two, so the average. And if you now take uh, the, the formula from before, where you really want to have a safety limit, um, let's say the absolute value of the deviation should be smaller than the safety limit, and you can insert the, the formula in here in between, then it, it comes out that the absolute value of x1 plus x2 should be smaller than two times the required safety limit. And this again can be done uh, using or applying this to the joint probability density function. And now I find all lines where the result of x1 plus x2 is the same. So applying now the safety limit, I know outside these safety limits, these are the dangerous faults which are violating my safety goals. So we have them uh, up and down. And uh, what you, I think, already realize is that the diagnostic functions is not fully covering uh, the, the safety requirements. Altogether, we will find now uh, this area where, for example, the violet ones, the PX1, 2, 3, and 4, are the areas where uh, we are violating the, the safety requirement, but we can detect. So this is safe. Uh, on the other hand, we have these red areas, PA and PB, um, where we are violating the safety requirements, but we cannot detect. And you also see there is also uh, areas P, C, and D where we are detecting a fault, but we are not violating the safety requirement. And to get diagnostic coverage, uh, we are just uh, taking the probability um, of P, A, and P, B yeah, in that manner to, to calculate the diagnostic coverage figures. And this is done in that case by a coordinate rotation of the, of the probabilities and integrating the area. In that case, it's the area PA and PB, and I get real numbers, numbers where we can continue for further calculations. So um, now, uh, getting the calculated the coverage with this sweep of analog functions, which I mentioned before, we get a, a, a nice characteristic. Um, here on the x-axis, you see the standard deviation of faults, and in the beginning, let's say with, without any deviation, we have nearly 100% coverage. And also when the Gaussian fault has wide distribution, uh, the coverage is quite high. And there is a certain, let's say, worst case point uh, where we are in, in the middle, where uh, a high probability uh, is remaining, where we will hit these red areas before the PA and PB. And taking these worst case points, for us, because we really don't know what is the real distribution, and these worst case points can be used for for the calculation later on. So, when we draw everything uh, in, in another graph, there on the x-axis we have the safety requirement, and uh, here's the graph of the possible diagnostic coverage figures which you get, and you see. Um, there is, uh, for in this example from before, if you take 4% uh, of safety requirement, in that case, taking uh, two times the safety requirement, we achieve 97.5 diagnostic coverage. 
And we can change this by changing this mechanism limit. And uh, you also see here that the, uh, the lower the safety limit, this, the lower is the Darcy coverage, but the lower the diagnostic mechanism limit, so uh, I can increase the diagnostic coverage. In that case, I can optimize uh, the diagnostic coverage, which I need. And this actually is what we did with our system. We, we told our customer where to set this diagnostic mechanism limit to achieve the required diagnostic coverage. And to conclude, um, this is the, a statistical method which uh, was applied to estimate these diagnostic coverage figures of redundant systems. And this is a, for us, it's a breakthrough in getting a numeric uh, diagnostic coverage values, uh, which uh, without any time consuming simulations or fault injections, and uh, we can estimate the figures even before the implementation of the full sensor system. And as an outlook, for sure, this method can be applied to other redundant sensor configurations. This was one special case, which we need to develop. And uh, you can also apply this for force alarm rate calculations when we take uh, the, the blue areas uh, from before. And for sure, this is uh, one method we can also use to optimize redundant sensor system, which will be the work basically of my next year. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm open for any questions. <laughs>